workshop today uh, to allow you for an opportunity to provide uh, additional comments or questions. So really quickly, uh, the agenda for today, um, doing the, the welcome, uh, I'll be taking attendance in a second. Then we were gonna go in over those uh, phase three engagement that we finalized uh, last month in May. Then the plan implementation and framework development, going after uh, tools, components, uh, ge geography level of effort and final outcomes and post-study expectations. And the last agenda item will be final thoughts and next steps. Can we, uh, Adam, go to the attendance? I don't know where that was. Okay. We have anyone from Central Line in a I'm just gonna call the agencies and if, and if somebody's uh, representative is here from that uh, jurisdiction or agency, uh, if you don't mind, unmute yourself and just uh, say your name, please. So Central Line uh, Regional Council. City of Charlotte, uh, Katz. This is uh, Brian Adonley with Katz. Good morning, Brian. City of Charlotte, see that? <laughs> Okay, Cedar Charlotte uh, Planning and Development, Design and Development. Kathy Cornett Planning. Good morning, Kathy. City of Statesville, Steering Committee. Idaho the County, Steering Committee. Um, Matthew Todd. Good morning, Matthew. NCDOT Division 10. NCDOT Division 12. Mark Stafford, Division 12. Morning, Morgan. NCDOT Planning Division. Dominic Boyd. Good morning, Dominic. NCDOT Turnpike Authority. Oh, and I see we have David McDonough. Good morning, David, from CATS as well. Arfats. Good morning, Augustine. This is David. Good morning, David. South Carolina DOT. Technical Committee, uh, CRTPO Technical Committee Board. Committee chair, Chairperson. Town of Cor Cornelius Steering Committee. Town of Davidson. Town of Huntersville, Town of Morrisville, Erica Martin planning. Good morning, Erica. Town of Pineville, and Town of Trauman for the steering committee. Anyone from the adversary committee? I just really quickly going to go through the list as well. City of Charlotte. City of Statesville. Good. Yeah, Sorry, this is Julie Isold. Oh, I'm sorry. Good morning. City Charlotte. Morning. Good morning, uh, Ms. Julie Isold. Um, apologies for skipping you. I didn't notice you were on the on the call. Uh, City of Statesville. Town of Cornelius. FHWA. This is Loretta. Good morning, Loretta. Good morning. That's Gary with Cornelius. I didn't get unmuted quick enough. Good morning, Gary. Out of the county, advisory committee. NCDOT, advisory committee. Town of Davidson. Town of Huntersville. Town of Morrisville. Erica Martin. By the way, this, this is at the advisory committee members. So they are uh, primarily elected officials or representatives from the board. Oh, my apologies. No, that's okay. Town of Trauman. And anyone from your county. Okay, well, again, thank you and good morning. If, I, if you're not part of the steering committee or advisory committee, please just type your name on the chat box just to keep, uh, list of attendees. Thank you. 
Next, please. So we, we're gonna be conducting a couple of uh, surveying questions through Mentimeter. Now for the moment, uh, that will be the, the link website. You can access this through your smart, through, through your phone or computer. And the code will be 75744645. And I put that on the shop box. And that will also be on the screen with every question in case you miss it. Thank you, Adam. Okay, next please. All right, um, let's go back to the, a little out of order today, but we'll start there, Augustine, go ahead. So a quick reminder on the end goal for the Beyond 77, uh, the vision statement for Beyond 77 will be to strengthen the multimodal network surrounding the interstate by providing an strategic, innovative, equitable, and comprehensive toolbox of effective strategies, policies, and programs that will guide future mobility for our diverse communities. Overall, improve mobility for everyone. And uh, today, Augustine and I don't want to present to you. We want to, to talk with you. Uh, and so some of you have seen some information that we're going to talk about through the recap uh, from phase three. Um, and uh, we did, I think our last presentation, Augustine, was with the City of Charlotte um, Transportation Planning and Environment Committee. And I believe Julie Eiselt uh, was present for that. And so um, this will be familiar to you, Ms. Eiselt, and to others, maybe you'll see it. But this is, uh, we're ready to, to tell you all about our successes together. Um, mm -hmm. So starting off at the, at the top really is uh, looking at the results at a quick glance. We, we have a ton of um, lessons learned from this to share with the region on how we had such successes with public engagement. But overall, um, throughout the entire process, we have received just over 25,000 survey responses with well over a million, if not more than that, in terms of data points and how we want to digest it. And so it was certainly a behemoth of, a, of an effort to kind of dive through all that information and help boil it down. Uh, so I'll showcase a little bit about those dashboards that are available on our project website uh, in a bit. But uh, the team between CRTPO and their partners on the public side, as well as the consultant team, uh, really adapted to COVID and tried to present a blend of virtual and in-person events as much as we could. Um, and so that happened a little bit before COVID uh, took over. Um, and so here you just see kind of the high level statistics, the, the millions number, Ms. Eisel, that you were referencing in a recent council session, uh, that's not a part of this screen, but it still stands true um, in terms of how we did our marketing uh, and advertisement. So we did hold two virtual public meetings. Um, we had 217 people attend those between the two. And just for phase three, which ran for six weeks with a pretty technical survey with some very tough questions to answer where people needed to figure out some things, we still received close to 5,500. And so that is a ton of information for all of us to work with to help continue with our implementation uh, development process. Augustine, anything else that you want to share? No, I think you recap pretty well. Thank you. All right. Um, and so this is uh, just a screenshot of uh, one of the dashboards. This one will be available to you all through our project website in the coming days. Um, but there are three of them, one for each survey. Uh, it's fully interactive um, and you can play with the data, look at the zip codes relative to the jurisdictions you serve, or you can break it down by zones, um, different demographics and whatnot to really kind of see what people are talking about in terms of how we evaluated uh, the outcomes and the strategies to move forward um, to then help inform your management and elected officials. Here's what we're hearing from our public and here's what we could or should be supporting in the short or long-term futures with regards to transportation and planning. Uh, so pretty excited to have these tools available to you and they will remain active uh, for CRTPO beyond, no pun intended, I guess, uh, to have that data available and interactive moving forward. Augustine? I don't mean, I don't think it's um, live yet, right? 
This one is not live. Uh, okay. It will be uh, probably in a week or two. Okay. I posted the link on the chat box. Uh, it will be posted uh, in that same link along with the other dashboards. Yeah. So I really encourage you to dive into this. You can get lost in the data, but have fun with it. Uh, this kind of supplants the reports and summaries that we've uh, worked on with, with our CRTPO. Um, so it's there as a tool and a guide to help figure out what's the next steps. And one thing to mention is there was an open-ended question uh, for the survey asking about the what people foresee as the challenge or the biggest challenge for really the implementation part of the OBI 77. So we got, I don't know how many, I don't know, over Almost 2,000? 3,000. 3, <laughs> uh, of answers. So we, we had to filter, had to remove some of them because of inappropriate language and not too kind comments. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, we're working through that and, and it should be relatively easy to navigate through them. We're grouping them by category. So you can see if people are talking about safety, you can see some of those comments through for safety. They're talking about uh, politics. Uh, mm -hmm. Their concern is about the political environment and you can see what are the comments on that, uh, on that area and so on. Absolutely. And all those comments are tied to the zip codes. So you can localize those comments as well. So again, that will be the last. So when you start uh, changing the pages in, within that dashboard, it will be the last question because it was the last question on the survey. Mm -hmm. This is where we get into the millions uh, of stat statistics with our engagement process. Uh, incredibly overwhelming responses. We worked with a uh, communications firm to help with public relations uh, and in partnership with Judy Dellard O'Keefe and other CRTPO staff to really make sure that our, our messaging was comprehensive and appropriate to reach multiple audiences uh, around the entire region, not just within the corridor. So anything from, you may have seen billboards, digital or print, uh, you may have received a mailer at your house, you may have seen radio or heard radio ads, you may have seen um, banners on websites that you visited and then we stalked you because you searched something related to Beyond 77. So we did it all. And so because of that, we were able to get the media to pick up on it. Uh, and so based on their outreach to the public and um, kind of the, the broad scope of who they, they communicate with, it was close to 40 million media impressions over just shy of three months of engagement efforts uh, throughout the past 18 months. So just awesome, awesome turnout and um, awareness that we helped to bring to the, the region. In this list of uh, that you see on the screen, they, they were the ones or well, media entities that uh, feature some kind of uh, either an interview or an article on their on their respective uh, uh, platforms. So, for instance, we have a, an interview with Channel Three, Telemundo, and uh, ninety point seven. That's right, and we uh, we've developed kind of a digital scrapbook so that uh, CRTPO and partners can rely on those publications to reference back to if they need to for any support uh, with creating strategies moving forward. Uh, just another quick thing that we, we made sure we wanted to happen was instead of asking people to come to those virtual meetings, we actually went to groups of people in their virtual settings. Uh, there was one that we did in person um, and it was kind of an offshoot request uh, so it's not listed here with these 12 primary community partners, um, but this is, um, we met with virtually 125 individuals, but of course their networks were much more expansive than just who attended those calls. And so from anywhere from economic development groups on a regional scale to large nonprofits, uh, like the Second Harvest Food Bank of Metro Lina, which is just a monster of a nonprofit here in the region that serves uh, a lot of our communities. Um, so really just incredible uh, outreach and acceptance. Uh, they wanted to hear from us. So, so with that, Augustine, um, any questions or comments about our public engagement efforts? Very well, let's jump into the third item. I know it's early in the morning, so I hope you, you're drinking coffee behind those cameras off, so. Um, so I wanna, we wanna dive in with you to talk about how we're moving forward 
uh, with the plan implementation framework. You know, we've had a lot of fun doing engagement. Uh, we've done a lot of existing conditions reviewing um, of everything that's throughout the corridor and beyond it. Uh, and so I'm going to back up for a second while we have this slide for context. And we started this process probably about 10 months ago uh, with some stakeholder workshops where we started to dream. And we wanted to bring some subject matter experts in to talk about what could be. Uh, and we've brought that to this group before to showcase that initial process and what came out of it. So we created a list, we presented the CRTPO probably back in November. And uh, that list has been finessed and refined, added to, removed, uh, edited and modified. Uh, and so kind of where we stand right now, there's a list of strategies and solutions um, that we published for phase three in draft form. There were 176 items as a part of that list and we created an interactive dashboard. And I, I understand that it might've been a little challenging to navigate but through um, conversations like this, as well as reaching out to our partners at folks like DOT, David Hooper, and your counterparts at RFATS and people in South Carolina, uh, we received a, a close to 200 comments on individual items on that list, which was great because it really helped us to identify some areas where we needed to modify um, or change. And then of course, my entire team went back through the list and we was like, maybe we can consolidate uh, or remove this. And so we offered up some considerations uh, to the MPO. That being said, there was a series of actions that we presented to CRTPO uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and so at this point, those actions resulted in 16 new strategies or solutions for consideration to be pushed forward in the final list, 35 new subcomponents, and we'll get into what I mean by that um, in a few minutes. And then eight of them from the original list were combined into others to help reduce redundancies. And then 10 of them were actually taken out um, by lots of different feedback and comments from folks. So the updated list for evaluation is 182 uh, individual strategies and solutions. And when we say that, um, the timeframes that we have talked about is starting in 2022 uh, and beyond 2050. So I wanna put that in context. So it's not like we're all going to do this work in three years kind of thing. Uh, and then there are actually a total almost 300 individual line items. And we'll get into the concept of toolkit items and projects in just a second. Any thoughts, Augustine, or questions or comments from the group as to this process? So the, the dashboard on their website um, has not been revised. So if you go right now, you visit it, you will see the, the list from April or in May. So again, these changes that you that we're talking about that we're going over right now, they haven't been applied to the to the website yet. It's everything taken uh, outside the, the website. That's a great point. So my team got busy, uh, and we went old school, and we created the implementation framework process. Uh, we pitched this to CRTPO and the internal team back in April. And we started to create some initial assumptions and definitions. So we focused on time frame, And then the second piece that you see, which creates this two-dimensional matrix right now, is a perceived level of effort and or feasibility. And so those titles would be uh, an MPO leads one of them, MPO assigns and coordinates or kind of taps somebody to lead uh, something and then coordinates with them throughout the process. And then what's highlighted currently stands as a definition, and we're going to talk about this and we really want your feedback on it, is we developed something called small, medium, and large jurisdiction purposes. Um, and so I want to dive into more about that um, to kind of talk about the context. But before I do, actually, I'm sorry, did you want to say something about? Just reminding people the time frames uh, at assumptions, not, not so much on the, on the years for each of those time frames, but when we classify a strategy or solution, in any of those categories, um, we're gonna be asking for that feedback as well. So if you feel that one that for instance might be in the intermediate, that is not feasible. That you strongly believe that that's probably gonna take more than two years before you start. That, that would be the start of any of those uh, strategies. It doesn't mean it start and end. Uh, but if, if you, when, when we send you out the revised list and, and information that we have that you feel that one of those items, the assumption for the, the start of any of those timeframes is incorrect, 
then something we, we, we want to know. Yeah. So before we dive into getting feedback on that, I just wanted to give you some context here to tell you how the evaluation process went forward. Um, we are relying on a multi-scenario evaluation process. And that evaluation output is really serving as a kind of a check and balance to how we assign those timeframes and how we assign those high level assumptions. Uh, so that if there's a piece uh, or a strategy that is really kind of aligning very well with all three of these or one strategy uh, aligns with one of these scenarios and the MPO may wanna shift it forward up in the timeframe or maybe shift it later, due to some risk or perceived issue, we will go back and look at that every single time in line item. So it's gonna be a very tedious but complex process to make sure that this implementation framework serves all of you uh, in a, an appropriate manner. And so these are the three different waiting scenarios that we applied and we are looking at um, every single one of them in tandem with each other. So we are not separating the outputs, we are looking at them uh, in the aggregate. This is just what it looks like when we put it out. Uh, it looks a little crazy, but we've built in a whole bunch of filters to help break it down and focus things in. Um, this may be what Augustine um, may provide. I'm not quite sure. We haven't worked on that yet. Um, but this is how we break down and filter out the evaluation outputs for all of us internally to kind of help focus on that check and balance process uh, based on the six key factors that were designed in the evaluation process that we've updated you on before. Um, and this is just looking at one of those scenarios. But the key thing to really help inform us about what is or isn't aligning well is kind of doing a sensitivity analysis. So we've got those three scenarios. What you're seeing here is a graph. The top one is all of them together. The bottom one is just those in the category of programming, uh, one of our four key areas from our transportation life cycle, if we go back in time to remember that process. The items on the far left of the charts are demonstrating those with uh, outputs that are um, ranking high. So those are the number one ranks based on the evaluation process outputs. And the ones on the left are the ones that are ranking very low. Now, some of you helped us to identify those one dimensional items such as freight. Freight is not a multimodal aspect. Um, and so, but it's just as important to look at freight solutions and strategies as it is to look at multimodal approaches. And so that's why we built all these filters to help us draw out some of those mode specific items associated with these key areas. So I pulled out programming to showcase that example. Programming is the one that actually has a wide variation across multiple of the strategies because they are one dimensional in essence. Some of them are truly just documented to be effective rideshare coordination programming. That's very, very one sided, but could be uh, just as important as looking at a full on congestion mitigation measure. So just wanted to make that clear. And that's how my team is kind of doing that balancing effort as we go line by line by line. Augustine, any thoughts or any questions on this process? Mm. I just want to ask the group if anybody is this understood or anybody has any questions. I know this can be a little bit complicated to understand. I see Kathy moving, shaking her yeah, head. So I appreciate that, Kathy. Follow us, <laughs> but she's lost. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued because, um, you know, for how this lines up with some of the work we're doing on the comprehensive plan implementation. So this is super helpful to see. Um, and I've had to be out a little bit because of that project, but now um, looks like I'm jumping back in at a very good time. Okay. Awesome. Now, initially before phase three, we were aiming at having one a scenario. And then after that, we realized that it would be best to keep multiple a scenarios. Primarily because then that, that would allow some flexibility or oh, it will allow for the decision makers to see multiple options. So that if we wanna take a more traditional approach, which is the scenario number one, we can choose to do that versus maybe a non-traditional approach as a scenario two. Scenario three, again, is based on the feedback from the public engagement phase three. Any other thoughts or questions from the crowd? 
Okay, well, we can come back to it if you do. I know it's heavy stuff for 9.30 in the morning, um, but we're going to, I'm hoping we'll get to have a dialogue with all of you. <laughs> um, and so we're going to talk about toolkit components and geography level of effort. And so I'm going to bounce back to those three phrases that I highlighted on the previous slide, the small, medium, and large jurisdiction. And I want to kind of give some context here um, before we dive into that. And so beyond 77, based on the scope, um, is the final output is really to provide all of you with a master list uh, or a suite of strategies and solutions for you to pick and choose from. But some of them, or almost all of them, are related somehow. Uh, and so we wanted to help break it down initially to help provide a perceived level of effort from a staff resource perspective so that you are aware of what you need to plan for in the near or long-term future. So you've seen here before what I said in the numbers. So we have developed 182 of those primary or standalone strategies and solutions. That's what SNS stands for. And then the team has then developed 112 subcomponents to a lot of those SNSs, really to help hone in on how to break it down further because not all issues in, in our thought process really apply um, at the same level across the entire corridor or the entire metropolitan region. There's a scalable component there. And it, uh, even I think, Kathy, you might agree that even in the city of Charlotte, there's a big difference between Uptown and Steel Creek. So if we have to figure out how to scale uh, those strategies to it. So to start out top high level, um, I wanna talk about the time frame first before we dive into the level of effort. When we're talking about projects and there's a series of projects associated with our list, the time frame that we've assigned to them is for when we expect to have them completed. And then for everything else, for policies, programming, and any emerging technology strategies that we have documented, the time frame suggested is when to start the process of each of those strategies. I guess you could put an end or finite process on a policy or program, but really it's when you should forecast to start the process. Um, the other thing is we have come into a uh, kind of a unique situation where we've recognized that policies and programs that are recommended at this point in time are not always necessarily geographic specific. Uh, it could be through final toolkit definitions and that's what we wanna talk about with all of you today. And then we've got this incredible effort going on. One of my uh, team members is on the call with us today, James Parkhill. We are going through this list and trying to draw connections, whether there's a predecessor or successor to every single strategy and solution on the list to help inform you a logical order of implementation over a 40, 50 year timeframe, as well as indirect relationships to help you understand as you're creating a program or a policy or even a project, what is it relying on from past efforts? Or what do you need to look forward to to then include in something at the point in time you're at. Any questions on these assumptions before I jump into the, the discussion point? I'm gonna start calling names if I don't hear from people. <laughs> well, maybe there's not questions, I don't know. <laughs> maybe we're just really good at this, obviously, and I. I don't wanna make that assumption. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I'm going to door dash a cup of coffee to all of you. So. so to help MPOs with determining appropriate level of effort or perceived feasibility with respect to staff coordination, we as the consultant team working in coordination with CRTPO have coordinated, incorporated the following definitions. Uh, we have small jurisdiction defined, meaning a small group of staff resources between MPO as well as the jurisdiction or jurisdictions in question. And then large jurisdiction would be the larger magnitude scale. And I've got to look at the chat really quick because some people are laughing. I got to make sure. Oh, I'll, I'll jump right on it, Bob. Is there a request for uh, Duncan, Krispy Kreme, or Duck? Which one? Krispy Kreme. <laughs> Fair enough. Oh, so um, I want to make sure that that's understood first before I move forward. And we're going to dive into our first question here. And some people have already uh, uh, started this process, but 
So toolkits to be useful and relevant across the region, whether it's the corridor or further and beyond, they should service resources that convey scale and feasibility. Currently, we define what I just highlighted, small and or large. Is that uh, agreeable to all of you or should there be something else? And so I just want you to at least give me on a scale of one to five what your level of agreement is with what we currently have documented as assumptions. And then we're going to get into a discussion. And a lot of you are in kind of management roles as to how to forecast uh, this with your groups um, and how you coordinate across different departments and jurisdictions. So how would you foresee this helping you support your initiatives in the future? I don't know why that wasn't updating live, but so far we've got uh, eight people participating. Nine, awesome. Got a pretty high level of agreement here, Augustine. Okay. And again, the the code for the Menti website is on is on the chat box. Eleven people. We'll go ahead, and I don't know how many people we actually have on this call. See that we have, including us, staff, a uh, total of nineteen participants right now. Okay. Well, that's good. I'm I'm glad to to see that we're on the right track. Um, we'll have a, a little bit more of an open dialogue about this. Um, but I, I will continue on. I apologize this is not updating live on the slide. But um, so based on that level of agreement, tool the toolkits and associates give, what are your thoughts if we were to pursue an alternative definition? And maybe we, maybe based on a 4.4, I'm curious as to those that maybe offered a lower than five. Uh, I'm just curious as to your thoughts. And I don't know who said that or who indicated that, so I can't call on people. So anybody? Well, Augustine, it looks like we are on the right track. And bear claws are coming. <laughs> All right, well, uh, we can move on uh, and we can come back and talk more about it if something pops into your head, if you're cool with that, Augustine. Yes. Okay. All right, so some of you may have already kind of gone ahead of me um, with some of the questions here, but one of the other topics, and Augustine, maybe I'll let you touch on this first before I dive in to kind of give context as to where we're going with this question. Yeah, so the priority that we're talking about here is based on a couple of, probably more than a couple, but several comments for the phase three list that we had on the dashboard, which again is still on, uh, on available on the website. 172 line items or 76, I think. Um, so many people commented, uh, that list is overwhelming. It's just too much to review. And along that, many people commented saying, give me the, the top items. I would like to just see what are the top items out of this list. So that, that list is, is fantastic. We didn't get anyone saying, oh, I hate it. But again, they comment that this is just too much. It's overwhelming. Is there a way that we can, you can show me what are the top priorities, what are the best of the best, which we can, of course, because we have developed that process that we went over a moment ago. We can tell you which ones are because of the weights and because of our assumptions, the top items. We, we don't wanna give them a ranking or a number one, two, three, all the way down to the last one, but at least we, we think that by tiers, we can at least identify what are your top 
uh, tier and you and you lower tier. Uh, although we're gonna split this in different time frames and different um, uh, agencies uh, of the leading agency, whether it's at MPO level or DOT level, jurisdiction level, it will still um, be overwhelming for some of those uh, lists. For instance, you intermediate my end up with 80 uh, recommendations. So the point here is one or the other. Do we keep it all together showing as 80 line items or 80 recommendations or do we go with a system we identify you top and you lower? We don't wanna make it more complicated than that. Um, so for, for any given uh, time frame or group of recommendations that ended up with a, I, I would say more than 10, that will be the idea. Do we split it in, in an upper and in, in a lower? So when people are looking at the final report and the recommendations, we go over the, the uh, final deliverables in a moment. Uh, and this is really aimed more at the, at the hard report, at the actual document that we, we will print and we have a hard copy. So when people get their hands on it, they don't have to go through 80 recommendations. Uh, there is a trade-off, of course, here, right? If we keep it as, a, as the top tier, lower tier, versus the full list, uh, there are a couple of pros and cons on each of these concepts. Um, so again, this is really what we're aiming after. And we'll, we'll get to the, we really want to hear, so I, I see four people are already suggesting the tiers with priority, and I, I fully understand why that could be an option, but we do want to hear your perceived choice and trade-offs in the subsequent question after we do this one. And whew, nobody likes the full list. <laughs> And again, the full list won't be 180 items because the, those lists will be categorized, will be broken down. So no one will have to go through 180 all, all at once. I guess we should have done this question last. We're gonna talk about tags and identifiers. You guys might change your answers after this, after we finish the presentation. So we'll, we might revisit. <laughs> All right, well, 11 people who responded on the previous one. So we're gonna, we're gonna move on. Uh, clearly, we have to come up with a way to think about how to do this, Augustine, tiers with priority based on your description to the group. Um, but I am curious, um, going back to the presentation itself, um, so like I said, I we're really interested in, so Augustine alluded to generalize, there are pros and cons to doing one versus the other. Uh, we are interested in hearing from you all, whether you wanna type it in or unmute yourself um, to offer what, what would be the difference. And I, I will also highlight, we have created a, a slew of identifying tags or filters to help you hone in on things. So if you wanted to look at uh, transit related items only, or if you wanted to look at land use potential implications, or if you wanted to look at jurisdictional space only, or if you wanted to look at a time frame only, I mean, all those are built in already as we speak, um, but the list that's on the dashboard as we speak does not have all those at this point in time. It's been improved already. So let me actually pull up, somebody may already be typing something. I don't know it. There we go. <laughs> hey, Augustine and Adam, this is Bob. I, I wanted to mention one thing um, that, that I've learned um, is that you know, many of our TCC members, for example, are, um, are required as part of their jobs to be uh, a jack of all trades. You know, they have a whole host of things that they're dealing with. Um, you know, Charlotte is a little bit more, um, has more of a division of labor, uh, can, can afford that because of its size. Um, but the, some of the smaller communities, I mean, you're doing historic preservation at nine o'clock, you're doing subdivision review at 10 o'clock, uh, you might be, there's probably a third thing at a lot that sort of thing. So uh, 
making this as simple as possible for, for our TCC members, for example, is I think going to be critical. And I think the same thing applies to advisory committee members too, because elected officials, because they're flooded with a host of different issues on any given day. Um, and then, but even city of Charlotte staff, uh, you know, it, 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 while there's a division of labor uh, and you might have folks devoted to transportation, folks devoted to planning within those um, headings, you have uh, multiple issues because of the size and complexity of a city of 900,000 plus people. So it just, anything we can do to, to make this simpler for folks uh, mm. is going, I think is going to be vitally important. Thank you, Bob. Any other comments? And I see a, a comment already from the Duro or from the Mentimeter regarding the transparency. And I think that's really the, the biggest uh, constraint if we break it into a priority list. Am I right, Adam? That was the number one concern from the- Yeah, the and I, honest, honestly, so and to Bob's point, and you know, Augustine and Bob, I know that we've talked about this internally. I, I do want everybody to be aware that it's not, uh, we are not proposing that we're gonna do one versus the other. It's more of which one is gonna show more prominently. Um, and so we are planning a whole bunch of things kind of in parallel to make sure that this list is functional for lots of different audiences. And we have talked about this a lot actually as to who is the audience and how do we demonstrate that appropriately for some of you as staff, some of you as management, some of you that work with elected officials. And so, I, I mean, I am on I'm same page with all of you as to how we do this. And I'm actually meeting with a, a data developer uh, at noon today to try to figure out how do we boil it down for efficiency purposes and not just have a thousand page report that you have to comb through with a PDF bookmark system. Uh, and so we're, we're definitely on that track. And this feedback is going to help us um, get to that final point. Augustine, this is this is David. Um, I like the prioritized approach. Um, we've got a lot of great information there, but I'm looking at this more from a kind of a, a higher level, uh, like a craft level. When the planning agencies get together, I think having a short list for them to focus on. Uh, I'm assuming that there 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 was a core reason why the, the sequencing of different strategies was identified, and that there's a rationale supporting that. I'd like the agencies to be able to focus on the right things in the right sequence. And if we're making trade-offs, we know what those are in terms of relative prioritization. Also, since the MPOs are identified as either leading or coordinating, I think we would welcome the visibility so that when we get together in, in our annual planning meeting and think about where we want to be putting budget dollars, what things we want to prioritize, um, we're focused on the relevant short list so we can have a good productive discussion. Mm -hmm. I would like to hear from, uh, thank you, David, from either Loretta Barron with Federal Highway Administration or NCDOT. I, I know we also have, uh, after we went through the participant list, we got, uh, I don't know if it's pronounced Michael, Peterson with South Carolina DOT. So anyone from DOT or Federal Highway Administration, some comments on that, on this particular topic? Oh, Dominic Boy, who is from DOT as well. Um, Augustine, I have been kind of putting my comments uh, in Minty. Um, okay, thank you. You know, I do think, you know, providing the full list is more transparent, but it's also might also give the impression that it really is a lot to digest. And therefore, did they put this full list out here because they know I'll never get to the end and the end might be what they're trying to like skate by me. Um, so I, I think maybe I just put in prioritize the list by time frames so about the year that you're suggesting implementing it, um, because then it gives um, whoever's looking at the list 
um, the ability to look at um, kind of what needs to be done to get to that point, whether it's a change in policy or funding or whatever it is, you know, I think the prioritizer list definitely provides better information um, to those looking at it. Thank you, Loretta. From any of the DOTs, Mark or Michael? Just to piggyback off of what Loretta was saying, I, I agree with what she is saying in terms of the prioritized list. Um, it just helps in terms of understanding what really needs to be done at that point in time. Um, a full list is great too, because it's just overall information, but I know it can be a bit much uh, with all the things that are on the list. A lot of times it can get pretty lengthy. Uh, so like she was saying, you know, uh, <laughs> you might not be able to get to the end of it, uh, just depending on how long that list is. But a prioritized list just makes it way easier. Thank you, Dom. Good morning, this is Michelle from SCDOT. Um, I'm fairly new to the group, so I would ask that um, right now I just be able to listen and um, catch up, but it, from what I've heard so far, um, when it comes to publishing lists and so forth, I tend to agree with the previous two comments um, in terms of prioritizing lists, because typically we wanna to go to the most significant, what is the most important and so forth. And then, um, um, you know, provide you know data or or explanation or whatever um, as questions come about. Thank you, Michelle. I'm glad you joined us. Anybody else before we move to the next? And again, this uh, the remaining of this workshop is is for you all to to provide us your your input and feedback. Well, we'll 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 continue. I think that this is this will definitely be related to some of the next pieces that we'll talk about, Augustine. So, mm -hmm. um, so with that, um, we want to add a, a new layer to how we identify aspects of the list, and so it's kind of outside of the process of prioritization, uh, but it's to help the MPO partners identify who else they need to be. The, the coordinate and assign um, piece. And so to help MPOs achieve success with implementation of any and all strategies and solutions, what and or who are the typical coordinate agencies that should be identified? And I understand that this is, there are gonna be some standard answers, but uh, we'd love to hear from all of you as to who we need to make sure that we identify because they may be important for CRTPO to include on this. I'll give you a softball. I'm going to assume that NCDOT is probably a coordinating agency. Yeah, good point. DOTs. The regional council, so between Central Lina and uh, Kadava. Mm -hmm. Graf, I like that. Mm -hmm. I think the planning boards is an interesting one. 
you know, some jurisdictions have planning commissions versus others. I also see FSW8 on the list, which is, is great. And so it's certainly be... recognized. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was, I was going to say, say <laughs> this would be part of the, the action items. We're, we're going to be reaching out to you uh, with our assumptions of which agencies uh, will be the leading agency or agencies for all of the, uh, most of the, the strategies and solutions. So to, for you to, to look through those and, and just verify our assumptions. If our assumptions, whether it's an MPO level, DOT level, and so on, is correct. Uh, and also, so you bring up a great point, obviously. So it's going to be the assumed lead, and then who else needs to be at the table? Well, I'll say thank you, Kathy, uh, for being a part of this and congrats to the city of Charlotte on Comp 2040. Thank you, thanks. And I'll, I'll hope to see you guys um, to get the remainder of this. It was really good information, thank you. All right, so uh, we, I'll, this is this will remain active if you want to go back and add something. Uh, we won't close this down until the end of this presentation today of this meeting. Um, but if you have other thoughts that are not captured yet, you can feel free to go back uh, on the navigation piece of Menti and then pop in another answer. Or you can just email it to Augustine and myself if you feel as though something was missing. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm glad to see business leaders and large yep. employees, by the way, employers. Okay. All right. Uh, and so this is all going to help us define those toolkit components and geography level of effort. Uh, but we do have one final question. And so you've heard me allude to what we started to build that you don't see as a part of the current dashboard that's on our website, of all the different tags and identifiers. Uh, but we want to hear from you as to we may be missing some. And I know that it's going to be a uh, a little bit more of a challenge, but we're ready for that to make sure that we incorporate all the appropriate things to make it fully functional for everybody and all the different audiences that need to consume pieces of or all of this type of report and output from Beyond 77 for the future. So really is what types of tags identifiers, whether it's a jurisdictional name, generalized jurisdiction, um, mode, uh, time frame, of course, uh, what else would you want to see to make this useful for you and the work that you do on a daily basis? Adam, could you talk a little bit about what you mean by a tag or identifier in this context? Sure. I guess maybe a, a label. Uh, so if you are, um, if you want to look at um, a strategy set based on transit only, then you would be able to select transit and then the whole list would filter out everything except transit. And so you'd be able to look at so if you or if you wanted to see things that are only and solely associated with the town of Cornelius, then you would be able to see that so things that make the list way more digestible based on what you want to know about. Okay, so land use recommendations or mm -hmm. like ped recommend. Okay, good. Yep, Thank you. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Good point. So I think what we're missing here for context was to provide, perhaps provide the current tax that we have. 
Sure, I can and I can go back. We did. I did show that for a split second. Um, one second. So I know the one that was provided through that feedback in in April and May was to filter by. It's essentially filtering how we filter the solutions was by. We'll say by region, but I forgot what was the term, but uh, essentially by county, whether a, a solution was uh, Idaho County or Mecklenburg County or York, which True. for the project or implementation one, they can be, they are currently identifiable in that fashion, but not so much for your um, other uh, uh, types, right? Such, such as uh, programming, policy and technology, because again, those can be apply applicable throughout the entire corridor, not just to one specific ge geography. And so you can see here on the slide, and I'll go back to the questions and comments that you're providing. Uh, we currently have built into the evaluation model, which is translating over to the list database itself. Um, we do have the uh, small, we did have medium before we changed that out. So small, medium and large jurisdictions and then of course, the different levels of effort and uh, feasibility. Uh, and then we have the mode uh, filters broken down. So car, bus, mass transit or high capacity transit corridor based on connect beyond, uh, bike, pedestrian, freight, and then micro transit, ride share and other. Uh, and then of course, you can also look at any and all of those in um, looking through different implementation timeframes that we have defined uh, and then also broken down by the scenario uh, and the key area. So it's pretty comprehensive, but I, I know that there's still more that people probably would want to have to make this more functional. And so I did see some comments start to roll in through the Mentimeter that kind of highlights um, some of those. So we've already got the modes happening. So I'm glad you guys are, are saying that. So we, I'm glad that we can pr provide that as we state. Policies is a key area. So we are identifying that, which is great that you're identifying that. Funding source is an interesting one. Um, <laughs> that's a that's kind of a separate task. We um, we kind of shifted funding alternatives out of our list of strategies into its own thing, and so recognizing the sensitivity around that, that there are lots of things that happen in parallel but rely on funding to occur first. Uh, so we have proposed a strategy to encourage the region to look at funding alternative strategies based on the information that we produce in tandem with other initiatives going on. Uh, let's see. This so is an I, interesting I think, one. I think the what we item. can do, yes, I think that one is pretty interesting. What we can do, Adam, and committee members is to create the list that we currently have, or those filters mm -hmm. or tags, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then we, we can send you that list and for you to once review it and then tell us if we need to add anything else or perhaps remove. Yeah. We might have some of these tags or filters that don't really make sense. So I think that's something we can add for uh, next uh, items or action items. Absolutely. Well, thank you for that. Um, let's go back to this. All right, so uh, we want to talk to you, got with you guys about um, final outcomes of what to expect, and maybe even after we wrap up this process. Um, so, obviously, I'm going to let you roll through these couple of slides, talk about what we're planning on and how we're kind of designing things. So, for the final deliverables, we have a couple of things. The first one we have here on the screen is um, a high level summary. We call it as a right now, just document one. Potentially the official name will be a fact sheet or abstract or some other name, uh, but basically will be a four to six uh, aiming at a maximum of 10 pages. And it's just going to be a quick, super dry 
may a uh, recap of the of the report of the main report that will obviously the main report will be the second document um the tone as far as the how technical or non-technical for the writing we aiming at this document to be non-technical so it's just going to try to be as simple as possible so again it, it'll be the equivalent to an elevator talk where you can within 10 minutes get a good understanding of the, the study from beginning to end without any high level details. Uh, or, I'm sorry, any particular details. Again, it's just gonna be high level, so know the details. That's document one. Then we have document two, which is the final report. Now this report, uh, while it's going to be probably near a hundred pages, we don't know yet, but we aim it at keeping it below 100 pages, will not include the appendices. So it's gonna have, this is the layout or tentative table of content, one through 10. None of these chapters, particularly uh, number three to seven, so the public engagement information, existing and future condition and so on, down to final recommendations will have uh, details down to the details because, for instance, the public engagement alone could probably be 50 pages if we really want to include everything that has been taking place and in all of the information and numbers. The existing and future conditions, which was the data collection and, and evaluation of uh, plans throughout the region uh, during the phase one back in January of last year. Same deal, that could, we have a, a tech memorandum for that. It's close to how many pages? 100 pages alone. So we don't, we wanna keep the final report as clean as possible. And if we go into the details and, and, and all of the little tiny bits of each of these chapters, you end up with a report of three or 400 pages long. Uh, the tone, as far as the technical versus not technical, we're gonna make it a hybrid. So in each of these paragraphs, we're gonna start, or each of these chapters, the first paragraph is going to be non-technical. We want anyone that takes this, because uh, the audience for this is not just limited to, to staff, professionals, planners and engineers, but also elected officials, decision makers, as well as the public. Uh, as everyone is aware, we have a tremendous success in that in the in, with the public regarding participation and input. So we anticipate that many people from the community will be reviewing this this final report. So because of that, we want to make sure that it's, it's easy for anyone without the technical knowledge to really go through this document and, and, and get an understanding so they're not lost, like reading in Chinese or some other language, where they can really understand what we're talking about. Uh, so that first paragraph in each of those chapters will be not technical and followed by more technical information. Um, implementation plan, chapter number eight, we planning to make it as comprehensive as possible. So when, when I say that chapter three to seven is, is not gonna have the details, it's because that information will be in the appendix all the little details, that's not gonna be the case for chapter eight. We're planning to make the implementation plan as detailed as possible in this report. So people getting here, they can see the security summary and introduction. They can, they can go through all of the other, those chapters and really spend all of the necessary time in the implementation plan in just in this one document. And at this point, I wanna open it before I move on for any comments or questions for those approaches. Let me ask uh, Matthew or Erica Martin, Matthew Todd or Erica Martin, any comments on, on this approach? Maybe Gary from here? Looks good to me. And this will be something that we will share with you. Again, same for that. I know this is, along with everything that we have discussed, uh, it's probably a lot to digest all at once. So we will send this out and allow you all to provide any comments or feedback. 
The next document will be the uh, appendix. Appendices or a combination of multiple items. So document three will incorporate project sheets. We will go over that in a moment and the full list of the strategies and solutions or final recommendations, uh, all of them. So if we ended up with 180, uh, that's gonna be part of those, those tables, let's put it that way. And then the appendices, we do have a couple of tech memos, I think for uh, chapter four, chapter five at this time, and I think number six as well. Uh, again, this tech memos ranges anywhere between 20 pages in length to 100 and plus pages each. Adam, anything you wanna add? Okay, we, we own the project sheets, I think. Yeah, nothing to add here. It's just that we're trying to be as comprehensive as possible. And as, as Augustine and all of us have kind of alluded to, um, you know, we're cognizant of the layers of audiences here. It's not just designed for one group. It's, it's intended to be designed for multiple people. And so uh, we're doing our best to, to meet that need. Um, and so we have a lot of writing to do um, to present to CRTPO in, in the next month or so uh, for draft purposes. So as we move, we transition between those documents. Document one, the audience is general. So we respecting that everyone in general will be looking at document one. And when we move into uh, document two, the final report, no more than 100 pages in length, um, it'll be more limited to probably the elected officials and, 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 and staff professionals with maybe a combination here and there of uh, the public. Whereas by the time we get to the, the, the last category, those, those three items for document three, it'll be more uh, limited to, or expectation would be that staff professionals are the ones looking at these documents, like the tech memorandums, for instance. Yeah. So recognizing we have about 10 minutes left, there was one other thing that we want to get your comments on. So I'm going to continue forward. I wanted to, uh, as we just saw in document three piece, uh, this will be a part of it. And so looking at the, we created a template for our project sheet concept, just as with typical with an MPO uh, MTP process uh, that gets exported out. We created a template to try and combine all of the different pieces of information that allow that flexibility, context, and awareness of what each, each strategy is recommended and based on. And so this was reviewed by CRTPO staff over the past couple of weeks. Um, and it's comfortable with it moving forward. And we'll, we'll create a designed template uh, and a database that will include all those filters that we've talked about so that we can export them and automate it all. Um, so it will include some static mapping potentially with an image uh, as well as just a whole slew of information that you see here on the screen. Um, one second. Um, so let me continue on. There is another option that we are considering and we presented this to CRTPO and the internal team, I guess a week and a half ago. Um, so this could either uh, supplement or supplant uh, the first document that Augustine mentioned. And so uh, please ignore the present presenter's face uh, in these screenshots, but uh, this is a unique pamphlet that has been proposed um, to have as a, a hard copy that you could offer to your management or elected officials or even the public if you really wanted to. Um, and it would have the biggest takeaways of the entire study, but also tease them to want to go look at some of the tools and resources as a part of this report or some of the funding strategy information that we're gonna talk about in a second. Um, so I wanted you all to be aware of this. August, I don't know if you wanna seek uh, some feedback in the in the next week or so from this group on these, um, but this is what is being considered at this point in time. Um, the next piece, this is this is why I would love your feedback on. Let me give you context of what we're looking at here. So, in discussions with the internal project team, um, you've seen how complex the list is and the database is quite large. And even just to manage and filter different columns for the purposes of what you wanna look at can be a challenge regardless of who you are. And so my team has kind of looked around the world to see what solutions are available. And what you see in the center is an emerging concept to the private world has kind of adapted to this pretty well. It's called graph 
charting. Uh, and it's taking uh, a dynamic tool, a web-based dynamic tool, where you can identify and map out all of those strategies and solutions that we have documented. And then you start to assign colors or shapes and magnitude of shapes to allow you to be informed as timeframes. And then the lines mean a whole slew of different relationships and connections. So you start to see the sequence. And then all the filters can then be built in on this so that you can see in an immediate time frame, here's what you could be focusing on. And then looking down the line 40 years after that, you will be able to recognize what could come. So the things that we're discussing right now is, do we A, deliver just a simple Excel database, which is comprehensive in and of itself? Do we B, offer up the raw graph chart that you see in the middle? Or option C, do we then, as a team, develop a custom website, essentially, that feeds off the data in the bubble chart that you see in the middle, and it would be live and useful for all of you moving into the future? So really kind of want to hear from you after I give you that 30-second context. If you were to be using this, you know, if, if Bob, you were to use this with your board, or if Erica, you were to use this with your management and your local elected officials, how would you potentially rely on this to help filter out, focus in, and create those options for local and regional success. We do have a couple of comments and a question from Loretta. We'd like to oh, got raise it. that from Loretta, and if you wanna expand. Uh, so your question is about the documents. It's, it's, it's kind of, I don't know if I missed it before we jump into this topic. But uh, yes, indeed. So for that pamphlet, we're talking about having a fourth document. So document one, the high level report, no more than 10 pages. But the option here will be to, in conjunction to that, have this pamphlet. That will be that mountain or accordion type of uh, pamphlet. Um, it can be a supplement, so you can have document one and that pamphlet, or just one or the other. And, and, and so this is why we, we're gonna be asking for feedback on these regards. I think in, in essence, it sounds great, but it could be a lot, right? Um, regarding the cost and the, and the work, uh, I mean, our, our team is, is gonna move forward in whether we want all four documents. So, Document one, two, and three. Document two and three will happen no matter what. That will be the report and the appendices. So it's really a, a method of document one in this pamphlet idea. I'm not sure if you want to expand or elaborate. Uh, I would just say that this is our effort to kind of meet the charge that we were stated in the very early start of this is to have this be a living plan. So make sure that it doesn't just sit on a shelf uh, after its conclusion and make sure that it is a useful tool uh, for all of you for decades to come, really. Uh, and of course, be updated maybe on a cyclical basis, but really is to be a live dynamic thing for all of you and not just a binder that sits on the back. Adam, this is Bob. I, I wanna say that uh, if we're going to sell this thing long term, we need to know how to sell it. And traditionally, folks in positions like mine aren't good marketers. Um, we, can, we can produce good sound technical documents, but um, oftentimes they do sit on a shelf because we don't, we can't market them um, because we don't know how to do that. And so I think this sort of thing, like what you're displaying now on the screen, it might seem strange to some to be talking about this, but I think it's vitally important if we want to really sell this to market it uh, to those who are going to be implementing it. Otherwise, it's just going to be another dry as toast report. Yeah, and I, I'm glad that you brought that up to everybody else in this call. It's for those that are not a part of the internal team discussions, our communications firm that works on this with us pitched this idea to Augustine and Bob, um, and we have talked about how approachable this entire process has been for multiple audiences. And so this was the idea to make it, as you say, Bob, marketable, understandable, 
uh, and then you can offer this to somebody and it would have the biggest messaging components to say, here's why this is important for us to continue on with any and all of it. Mm -hmm. But I want to go back to this. Erica, you're right. I should have led with this <laughs> because it really gives context to everything else we talked about. Um, but I, I do, I'm really interested to hear as well. Oh, I'm not going to touch on that yet. Uh, I want to hear uh, as well, what are your thoughts on the scale that I described? You know, Excel database, a raw, funky bubble graph, or something that is very organized custom user interface tailored to MPOs and the region of all of you that work together. Um, what does it look like? How does it function? What does it do for you or your successors that come after you? Because let's face it, we'll all be retired when this thing is still going on. Let's hope. I haven't heard from Brian Adel, the with cats. So when I ask him, he has any comments and how will this how will he see this? I know David McDonald just left. I think he left just a moment ago, but for CATS implementation, how will CATS can benefit, or in general, some of the, the transit agency will benefit with a tool, interactive tool, tool like this? I mean, I see us more indirectly. I mean, I'm working on the, uh, the North Corridor BRT project. So, um, but the towns along the corridor will be more impacted. So, you know, we're partners with all the towns. So we'll be kind of like complementary. I feel more in nature for all this. Um, but if we propose any changes to 77, you know, to the hot lanes that are currently built, so we'll, we'll have an impact on, on them. So, you know, having these strategies can, can help us in that effort. Thank you, Ryan. I see a question from Gary. Uh, yeah, the... I just noticed that. Um, so Gary, the, what, what we're trying to look at here is just we provided options to CRTPO and we wanted to hear feedback from the steering committee. Um, so the, the, th the third option there, what I, I've highlighted is, is a custom user interface or a custom website to feed off the data from this graph chart. So the graph chart helps us to organize information from the list based on all of those tags, identifiers, filters, column splicers um, to help break it down. But what the custom UI would do is create this unique visual that would be an interactive graphic uh, that would help you to see the time uh, from start to finish based on the logic and sequences that we built in, as well as the relationships that exist between all of the items on the list and external relationships, such as what Brian just uh, talked about with certain CATS initiatives. You know, we're trying to document some of those at a very high level as well um, to kind of say, okay, well, whoever's coordinating on whatnot needs to be aware that this is gonna be happening sometime in this time frame. Uh, and so just trying to give you the best usability to, to make this move forward. And we also thought this would help set it apart so that it could continue to stay a dynamic livable type planning um, function. Gary, does that answer your question? You just well, said I, option, okay. oh, option C I see for that, me. yeah. <laughs> Any other thoughts on this one before I continue? All right, so we got one vote for option C and Erica, I will reorder my slides for the next group next week and lead with this. <laughs> okay. We did wanna highlight the other piece that you heard me talk about a little bit here um, is there's a complete whole side to this that's talking about money. Um, and we certainly recognize the efforts that have happened with uh, initiatives such as the Charlotte Moves and the Transformational Mobility Initiative uh, in the city and in, within Mecklenburg County. We are aware of the NC First Commission from a state's perspective and the funding discussions that are happening there. What we have done is scoured those documents, coordinated with those folks that are part of them, and 
we wanted to propose regional funding strategies on a multi-county scale. So what you see in front of you is we, again, wanted to build and publish a dynamic tool for any and all of you to use with your management and or elected officials, and even the public potentially to help determine a scenario based on the five or six different funding strategies that we've identified in the short term that are feasible, uh, you know, looking at the rates, looking at the year of time frame for implementing it, and then um, the counties to be involved. And then you can look at level of revenue potential to be collected over the time frame defined. But the interesting thing that we want to discuss is highlighting modal output scalability or magnitude. So we want to use uh, unit and total cost based on different modes. And I want to touch on that for a second because we just had a great call with a group that's doing an economic impact study uh, on transportation investments in the Charlotte region as of yesterday. And so our story will perfectly align with theirs because they're talking about the economic impact benefits based on infrastructure, transportation investment dollars. We're going to talk about what the opportunity is to leverage new funding to support that, and then they communicate together. Uh, so we, I'm pretty excited about that, um, but wanted you all to be aware that this is a tool that we are producing so that you can work with your boards and your elected officials and commissions to kind of have a dynamic discussion and not necessarily just a piece of paper with a static recommendation. You can play with the numbers, play with the fees and the timeframes, and then join a regional conversation as to here's how we seek to leverage a little bit more autonomy from the state and federal levels for funding opportunities. Any thoughts or questions? on that. As a reminder, uh, the workshop for July will be exclusively or primarily targeted to talk about the funding alternatives. So this particular topic is the main agenda item in very details. <laughs> oh, yeah. Actually, I'll pass it back to you. We have five minutes remaining. So we, before we leave, I want to give an opportunity for anyone to last questions or last minute uh, comments, concerns, anything at all that, that you would like to share with this group. So everyone at once. <laughs> they haven't gotten my donut delivery yet. That's, that's the issue. Now be mindful that we're really at the last mile <laughs> the very last uh, steps of of the beyond 77 we started back in september of 2019 and we scheduled to end on the on the end of september of this year so what would be that three months from now or less than three months we only have two more meetings the next meeting or workshop in a month from today and then as of right now uh, i sent a doodle poll last week uh, we're looking at either the, the first week of September or second week. Initially, we were th thinking of the last week of August to have the final meeting, uh, but we hoping to be able to meet in person, to conduct that uh, uh, meeting in person. So because of that, we push it for after Labor Day. I think it's, uh, the options right now are from uh, September the 8th and September, through September the 16th. Um, so please take the doodle poll. Uh, before the end of this week so we can go ahead and schedule something next week uh, for the final meeting and um, final draft and report so some of the action items uh, or next steps I, I'm going to be uh, next next week after the second workshop um, on Monday so probably by Tuesday I'll be sending out a final draft for the report the deliverables so a lot of the, the, the topics that we, we cover during uh, agenda item four and five uh, for, for you to review and provide any comments at all and feedback. So that will be the final draft, final report, supplement, material resources. Um, again, you'll, you'll be able to see, I, I'm gonna be sending a link for the pamphlet um, where you can see a video on, on how that actually interact and, and, and works. Uh, we ask, however, that any comments will be sent back by July 1st. So it's going to be a, a quick turnaround. Um, in the meantime, you know, just let me know, send me any comments uh, between now and there. Uh, again, be expecting by Tuesday. 
and it's going to be a really short window. Um, we, again, we don't want to assume that if we don't hear back from you, is that you don't have any comments or that you are good. So if, if you don't mind, please, uh, by July 1st, send us at least an email saying um, that we, 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 we are okay, we're fine with, with these deliverables or with this path uh, regarding the, the documents that we're asking you to review. Well, yeah. again, I know, ahead, yeah, so I was just gonna say, I know that it's been a, it's been a quiet morning, uh, but I did wanna let you all know, we as a consultant team, and I know working closely with the internal CRTPO, MPO partner team, I mean, we're super excited about producing these final results for all of you to have something actionable. And, and I know that you do, you guys do this every day, but this is, uh, this is a unique initiative and we're super, super excited to provide it and produce it for you. Um, so really looking forward to the final steps to, to get this rolling. Very well. Thank you, Adam. And thank you to the consultant team. You know, we only have two representatives right now, James Parhill and, and Adam, but there is a group of more than 30 people behind the scenes. We just don't have it in every single meeting, but there is a, a tremendous group from Atkins, uh, CDM Smith, uh, Jim, um, Jim County, who is, will be joining us for the next workshop in uh, Boston. So we have uh, four different consultant firms working for for the, uh, on this study. If there is nothing else, then I think we will be adjourned. And uh, we look forward to seeing you uh, in July. The, the main audience for that July uh, workshops will be the advisory committee. So the roles are gonna be inverted for those workshops in July. But uh, everyone from, from both committees will be welcome to join us and discuss again about the alternative funding sources. And I'm happy to stay here for a couple more minutes if anyone wants to stay and do a, kind of like a one-on-one. -on -one. I was going to also ask, you know, for you, August, and Bob, can you hang out for a minute? I don't know if you have to jump, but. I'm good to stay. You can stick around for a moment or two, Adam. Okay. Rada in, oh, I think Jorge left, but thank you so much for joining us. Uh, by the way, they will join us. Uh, because we're coordinating with them on the other initiatives, the 2050 MTP and the Connect Beyond uh, initiative. So thank you so much for your time, uh, everyone, and have a good morning. Thank you, Augustine Adam. Good feedback on the Mentimeter. Yeah, I really confirm. I'm glad that we're in the we're in the right direction, and we weren't kind of going off left field. Yeah, that's always good to good to see because that's an easy way to let folks know uh, mm -hmm. that uh, you're going that that to let a team know that you're um, going off track or you've gotten off track uh, because it could be done candidly anonymously and right. some sometimes people feel more comfortable doing that yeah. being anonymous. Mm -hmm. Um. Obviously, I know that I, for, I honestly forget what it was, but I did remember you wanted Bob to hang out for a second so we could talk about something. And I can I remember what it was. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes. Um, on Monday, uh, Bob, you and I we talk about the strategies and solutions regarding uh, yes. MPO consolidation. So I know we we rename renumber some of them. Uh, so the, we're just gonna go with the with the uh, all number. It was uh, PM2 uh, and PM3. So number two was a straight up, uh, you know, consideration for MPO consolidation. Number three was a, let me stop the. Uh, it was. Uh, no, I'm going to 